here intrinsic to their very understanding of Judaism and Christianity as we know it. These documents impinge and relate to the very origins of these two world religions. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say Qumran as the cradle of Christianity. What I would say is that Qumran illustrates the extent to which the Judaism of Palestine in this period, in its various forms, its various approaches, is really the cradle of Christianity. Jesus a Jew, but how Jewish was Jesus? Jesus was Jewish enough that if he came to a house that wasn't kosher, he wouldn't have eaten there. Let's put it that way. Qumran the Dead Sea Scrolls. An era of secrecy ends. Almost half a century after they were found, the Dead Sea Scrolls are finally published. Beautiful, it's amazing. I uh, didn't expect to see anything like this uh, was possible. Out and open for everybody now. Yeah, it's really, it's really amazing. Accessible to everyone. The Ta'amira clan of Bedouin knew the path by heart. For generations, their ancestors had driven their herds across this ridge in the Judean desert, facing the Dead Sea. It's 1947. Young Mohammed ad dib nicknamed the Wolf, has descended to retrieve a stray goat. At least, that's always been the favorite story. Or was he already hunting round for old objects to sell to the merchants of Bethlehem? A lucky stone's throw and a strange sound reverberating. That's how the first of 11 caves was discovered in which, almost 2,000 years ago, frightened people had hidden their most sacred scrolls. Hundreds of Bible books, commentaries, community rules. The most valuable and controversial archaeological find of the century. A find which uncovers fundaments in the history of Jewish and of Christian faith. The catacombs of the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem are the main depository for the parchments and snippets, pots and shards of the Dead Sea Scrolls. For many years it's been the domain of Joe Zayas, scientist and caretaker. What happens when you mix biblical archaeology and religion and science, you get this sort of cottage history of all kinds of crazy ideas, bizarre eccentric characters, absurd articles which appear in the American press, regarding uh, the whereabouts of Elvis Presley, cure for AIDS, the Loch Ness monster being found in Florida. This stuff appears in the press and uh, we get letters from people from abroad wanting to know whether or not these things are really true. We find it ridiculous, the whole thing is rather absurd, but uh, because it appears in the press, unfortunately, some of this, the word press. For decades, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been subject of tense public interest fanned by the press, which chronicles the slow pace of research turning into scientific scandal, and also by the nature of the scrolls themselves, documents from a time which shaped our religion and much of our culture. Controversy has always surrounded the scrolls. Found on the precise moment when Palestine erupted in two halves and Israel emerged, the scrolls were split on two sides of the border, the Jews were separated from writings they held most sacred. French Dominican priests of the Ecole Biblique here in East Jerusalem somehow came to lead research of a small group of scientists, almost all faithful Catholics. Rumor would later talk of a complot with the Vatican to withhold information which might fling itself into the face of Christianity. Unfounded, the research was hard enough as it was. Quand les manuscrits sont apparus. Ils étaient en très mauvais état, et très très rarement, euh, peut-être euh, 
un centième euh, ou deux centièmes a été en rouleau, euh, encore en place. The ancient settlement of Qumran, center for the people who wrote and hid the scrolls. Documents were found in 11 caves in a wide area around, and there may still be more. The richest treasure was found right across, separated from Qumran by a deep and dangerous cleft. The archaeologists were excavating right across the way, up on the site of Qumran. They went away for the weekend, and over the weekend, they came back and found that Bedouin in the interim had found this great collection of manuscripts right under their noses. They had been working right there and still couldn't find it. The standard story about this cave used to be that when the place was destroyed, the Romans saw some sectarians running away to try and hide in this cave. They followed right after them and saw this tremendous collection of manuscripts, took their swords, and slashed the whole thing up into all those little pieces. But to my mind, the real story of this cave is in these holes. They supported wooden beams in antiquity that stretched across the cave. And this was really the library of the sect, the vast treasure trove in which they found something like 600 out of a total of more than 800 manuscripts. And these texts were apparently arranged on these wooden shelves that stretched between these beams. When they came into this place, they found debris about a meter thick. The whole thing collapsed on the floor, so that we ended up with the greatest Jewish library of antiquity in something like 80 to 100,000 pieces, which were only later classified into some 20,000 pieces, or about 800 different manuscripts. A monumental task which was to take years, but as years grew into decades, expectation in the world of scholars turned into irritation and then anger. After 40 years, only half of the documents was published. The few scholars working on it denied access to all others. The only recognized interpretation of the scrolls was their own. To other scholars, the research turned into scandal. Everywhere you always ask a simple question. You must find this very surprising. You ask simple questions, and the simpler the question, the less likely you are to get an answer. That's the way it is. I don't know. No one knows what's in the unpublished documents except these, this charmed circle, as they call it, this little club of theirs who has all the cookies. Uh... The monopoly of the few was blown up by another scandal. In an interview, research leader Professor John Strugnell, an ardent Catholic, called Judaism a horrible religion that was originally racist, a Christian heresy that should never have survived. Strugnell was sacked. Israeli authorities opened the study of the scroll to all of science and complete publication on microfiche was prepared. It had already been preceded by activist scholars who pried open the old monopoly with pirate editions from photographs. As long as you had a monopoly, you had official interpretation. The official interpretation was the official theory, uh, the essay theory. Now we're going to the interpretation of the scrolls. Now it's all available. Since it's all available, it changed everything. And I think what you're seeing now is a totally new, almost refoundation of the field of Dead Sea Scrolls studies. Now we can get to the battle of the interpretation of the scrolls. This is where the battle is joined. Before the birth of Christ, Jews desperately fight off heathen rulers, successors to Alexander the Great, who has stamped the Middle East with the mark of Greek culture. Some of these rulers sought to eradicate Judaism, burning scriptures, erecting pagan statues in the temple for orgiastic rites. Women who had their sons circumcised were put to death with their babies hung around their neck. Under the Maccabees, the Jews reclaimed their freedom, but not for long. Fifty years before Christ, the Roman Pompey takes Palestine. Pompey tramples on Jewish faith by entering the Holy of Holies reserved for God alone. Many saw the coming of Rome as the end of times, bringing catastrophe, but also a Messiah to lead the Jews in a final war against all evil whereas Rome reserved its most hideous form of execution for would-be messiahs, and there were several. 
expectation grew feverish. The feeling that something dramatic was to happen pervaded Jewish thought. Many withdrew to prepare for this end of time. A Roman historian calls those in the wilds near the Dead Sea Essenes, living in peaceful recluse, stooped in prayer, with only palm trees for their company. Ce groupe là qui vivait là-bas, les Qumraniens, sont des Esséniens. Le groupe de, de Qumran a mené une vie communautaire. On le voit très bien par l'installation. The Dominican fathers of the Ecole Biblique saw this in Qumran, a recluse in the wilderness for peaceful, celibate monks who were stooped in pious study, shared their wealth and were led by an episcopus or a bishop much like this present-day monastery quite near Qumran. It's a notion which is still widespread today. Here in Qumran we are now looking at the scriptorium, which is the very room where those uh, sacred scrolls were written over 2,000 years ago. It is in that room, in the scriptorium, that they worked hard, those scribes, those very skilled people that were doing a delicate work. Most people think that the scrolls were all written right here in this scriptorium. But actually, we now know that most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written elsewhere throughout the country and brought to Qumran, where they were used and eventually found their way into the caves. Why did those scholars all believe that there had to be a scriptorium at Qumran? Because a scriptorium, a room for copying manuscripts, is part of a monastery. And these scholars mostly came from monastic background, and as a result of that, they imposed on the entire Qumran runes the notion of a monastery. They discovered the cemetery there, but the interesting part is that out of approximately 1,000 human graves that were discovered, four are told to have belonged to women. And this is very much in accordance. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the cemetery because it turns out that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the graves that were excavated at Qumran were graves of women and children. And this seems to throw tremendous doubt on this notion of a celibate sect. And when you read the scrolls themselves, you even have one text that says, from 18 on, one should have sexual relations after getting married. So it's pretty obvious, to me at least, that this group never was celibate. Why were they identified as celibate? Again, because of that notion that what this was was a pre-Christian monastery. That kind of a model was superimposed on the entire question of the nature of the Qumran sect. A different picture emerged here, when similar scrolls were found at this bitter last stand of Masada. Here, fanatical Jewish men, women and children committed suicide, rather than surrender to the Romans. It turned attention to a militancy resounding in the scrolls. On the march to battle, they shall write on their standards the truth of God, the war of God, the vengeance of God, the trial of God, the reward of God, the power of God. This is a God-intoxicated group, but this group is totally uncompromising. They have the pious, righteous indignation and enthusiasm. They will never compromise. They all went to their deaths, that is for sure. That's why the scrolls are in the caves, because no one came back to get them. And the problem, as I said before, that these elusive essays are never mentioned in the great compendium of rabbinic literature and in the New Testament. And the scrolls. And not in the scroll. They, 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 they are Hasidim and Kushim and whatever you want. I mean, the, the Pharisees. At conferences, more and more scholars are deserting the old theory of a small, pious, peaceful, pre Christian sect. I came to Ed yesterday that they represent one great stream which is opposed to the rationalist stream that developed in, in rabbinic Judaism, but Quran is only a small part of the movement, the second mainstream. This is a vast literature. This is a major literature. This is a literature of some 800 previously unknown texts. This is not a minor, uh, isolated, uh, small movement. This is, I've said, the literature of the opposition movement in the Second Temple period. Opposition in the time of the coming of the Herodians and the Romans, which is in the mid-first century B.C. If you want the truth about this period firsthand, go to the scrolls. Now the problem is that the Gospels are advertised as being first-hand eyewitness accounts of this period. I don't think those documents are the nature of first-hand eyewitness accounts. And I don't think there was a peaceful 
mystery mythologized figure who walks on waters, who raises the dead, this highly mythologized figure we call Jesus. Now I would set that aside and say that is overseas literature. That's not borne out by the Palestinian literature. I would say this is the Palestinian literature. This is the nitty gritty of what really was happening in the Palestinian milieu in the first century BC, first century AD period. Palestine, the seething cauldron of Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, Zanakites, Ebionites, of quarreling sects, groups, parties. In fact, it is a country split in two, between those accepting foreign rule and thriving under it, and those resenting it, those accommodating and collaborating, and those refusing to, who return to the purity of faith and pray for a Messiah. Their voice sounds in the scrolls. The Messiah, together with the poor, will rise from the dust and as an avenging force destroy the foreign armies, destroy all wickedness from the earth. They know they need a secret weapon. Their secret weapon is the Messiah and the heavenly host. Now, I don't think they're very good warriors. And I don't think they're actually uh, full of armor and prepared for war. I don't think they thought they had to. I think they thought if they just were absolutely pure, then the angels would fight with them and they wouldn't have any difficulty anyway. The scrolls do not give any coherent account of the times. What they precisely have to say must often be painstakingly deciphered and interpreted. They do not give clear references of time. They don't even mention Greeks or Romans by name, only enemy and evil. When they were written is open to interpretation and debate but the large majority of scientists today maintains that the scrolls date from well before the days of Jesus Christ. One has to remember that as a result of carbon dating in archaeology, it's clear that the copying of the scrolls that we have are pre-Christian. And this is not to mention the composition, because some of the texts were clearly composed already in the 3rd century BCE. So I think we have to completely eliminate as ridiculous any notion that these are actual Christian documents. Okay, if they were finished writing these in 50 BC, what did they do with a hundred of the most exciting years of Palestinian history? We know they were looking at these documents in 50 AD because they put them in the caves thereafter. You mean to say they were not creative, that they had nothing new, new, new to say, that they sat while the most exciting events and the most tragic events in Jewish and early Christian history were unwinding before their eyes and were reciting documents as old as Abraham Lincoln would appear to us today or Bismarck in um, um, Germany and they were saying prayers about these people and ignoring what was happening at their own time? I doubt this very, very much. But Eisenman is almost isolated in this. It's generally believed that the scrolls date from well before Christ on the basis of archaeology and carbon dating. Even though research by the Ecole Biblique is also subject of criticism and the precision of carbon dating sometimes contested. But Eisenman believes some of the scrolls may be from later date because of what he finds in the text themselves. We have an allusion to the foreign armies invading the country and in describing these armies it says they sacrifice to their standards and worship their weapons of war. And only Roman armies from the times of Jesus onwards sacrificed to their standards as these bore the bust of their deified emperors. Using internal data like this, Eisenman goes against the grain of the majority, a thing he sometimes seems to relish. This guy, one Jewish scholar, he's never been out here, he said, uh, Eisenman makes too much of the scrolls. They are as dull as the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is slate gray, dead in color. So are the scrolls. <laughs> he wrote this in Commentary magazine, one of the most famous magazines in America. I wrote back and I said, obviously your writer has never been to the Dead Sea on the bluest of blue halcyon days. <laughs> Nor can he understand the color of the Qumran literature. Vague as they are, parallels and common themes Eisenman sees between the scrolls and the origins of Christianity are too many to reject outright. Across the Dead Sea is where Qumran is located. And behind us is this fortress of Herodian where John the Baptist was put to death. John the Baptist. 
it's hard to avoid the parallels between him and Qumran. Both are in the same area. Both emphasize various purification rituals, baptism, purification of body and spirit by immersion in water. Both berate the establishment and priests for their laxness and accommodation with the enemy. And then he says, you generation of vipers, remember, the fire is in the fan and the chaff ready for the burn. John prepares in the wilderness for the coming of the Messiah, just as it is written in the scrolls. They shall separate from the habitation, separate meaning leave the uh, polluted area of ungodly men and go out into the wilderness to prepare the way for him as it is written prepare in the wilderness the way of our Lord make a straight path in the desert for our God both damn the rulers of the land for their vices like marrying of niece with uncle be it vague the harping on this practice Eisenman considers as another indication to date some of the scrolls for it was common with the Herodians who ruled as puppet kings in the times of John and Jesus. John's following is so large that he becomes a threat. The Gospels avoid the fact because it puts Jesus in the same mold. To them, John falls prey to the whims of a Herodian princess. But a Roman historian paints the true story. Josephus presents the Herodians as fearing John, because he is so popular, will lead a revolution. So there is no Salome, there is none of the favorite fairy tales of the birthday party and the dance of the seven veils that has come down in Western culture and art and opera as one of the favorite motifs and uh, themes. There is this stark preventive execution of a troublesome rabble rouser. The Dead Sea Scrolls don't mention specific events. They give a militant mood of the country and another understanding of the times. They make one notice contradictions in the Gospels. Beside the mild and mystic Jesus, there is another one, uncompromising with the powers that be, the cleansing of the temple. People should realize that the so-called money changers were actually those people who sold offerings so that they could be brought by people who had brought money rather than actual animals to offer at the temple. And Jesus felt that even this was intolerable within the context of the temple. Jesus is placed by this story on the side of the strictest observance of the law in a certain sense. A militant Jesus, more in the mold of the Dead Sea Scrolls, those not accommodating, challenging the priests and their Roman masters. What do we know about the historic Jesus? Do the Gospels get the facts about him right? Jesus entering Jerusalem on a humble white donkey. In Jewish tradition, at least as far as we know from later sources, there was a notion that the Messiah would arrive at a white donkey. And therefore it seems that the Gospels place Jesus on this white donkey in order to symbolize that he is the Messiah, just as, by the way, they place his birth at Bethlehem, which is the birthplace of King David whose descendants are supposed to occupy the messianic throne. Historians now think Jesus probably came from the north in Galilee, not from Nazareth. The place didn't even exist yet at the time. That epithet must come from the word Nazarini, meaning keeper of the law. The Gospels go to extraordinary lengths to get him born in Bethlehem. The Gospel of Luke, for instance, the no, the no room at the inn scenario. The Lucan Gospel drags his family back to Bethlehem when they're living in Nazareth and there's no room at the inn. So we get the favorite picture of Jesus born in a manger. But that's totally contradicted by the Gospel of Matthew. Because in Matthew, Jesus' family isn't living in Nazareth yet. They're still living in Bethlehem. And that's the scenario of Herod still being alive. We have the picture of Jesus' family living in Bethlehem and Herod wanting to kill all the Jewish children. Jesus' family is portrayed as fleeing Bethlehem. This is the contradictory material that you have in the Gospels as we have them. And I'm not putting that down. I'm saying that they self-destruct. They are self-defeating. Because given the contradictory nature of the information, all we can say is, what do we know about Jesus? Absolutely nothing. Because all the data contradicts itself to the point of reducing it to nothingness.
Historians have always known, but to Christians brought up in the belief that Jesus was the only child of Mary who remained virgin, it will come as a surprise that the real Jesus had several brothers and sisters, and that after Jesus' death, his followers are led by his brother James, also called the Just. Eisenman believes some of the scrolls and this early church have much in common. Both call themselves the humble, meek, or poor, ebionim. So the scrolls are using the same word to refer to the community of the righteous teacher that early Christianity uses to refer to the community of James. Let's be very careful. Are you saying these are the early Christians or not? Not early Christianity as we know from the scripture as we have it. This is early Palestinian Christians. Now we have to, to, to decide what is meant by Christian in Palestine in this period to understand your or answer your question. And that is another technical discussion that we can have. Do you mean there is a difference between the early Christians of fact or the early Christians of faith? Of course. There is a, a, a vast difference. And I don't even know if they were ever called Christians. Neither would they have seen themselves as Christians. The Bible hardly talks about this earliest church, about James and other members of the family of Jesus. They didn't see themselves as a separate church. Their only difference from others lay in the hope that Jesus would one day return as a Messiah. But otherwise they were strict and pious Jews, much in the mold of the writers of the scrolls. Again, the scrolls make no clear mention whatsoever, but if some are from these times indeed, Eisenman sees a fascinating parallel. Three persons emerge from the scrolls. The leader, called the Righteous Teacher, who did not found the movement, but gave it direction. The wicked priest, an outside enemy, and probably Jerusalem's high priest leading the establishment. And a third and fascinating figure, once part of the movement, but now outcast. He's called the Liar. And this liar is specifically said to teach straying from the law, to remove the boundary markers which the forefathers, the ancestor, had set down to lead people astray in a trackless waste and to have denied the law in the midst of the whole community. Well, nothing could be a better description of what Paul does in both the Jerusalem conference in the book of Acts and in his writings. Paul considered as the liar? The Gospels narrate how Paul, sent by the high priest to arrest followers of Jesus, is converted by a blinding vision on the road to Damascus, Syria. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Damascus is used as a code name for the region where the wilderness camps are located. It has been proposed by some scholars is that Damascus here was a district within the, the Roman uh, administrative system and so that what you have in the word Damascus is simply another term for the Qumran region. A conversion here to the beliefs of James, but later bringing him in conflict with it? Though most scholars, including Larry Schiffman, categorically reject linking one with the other, it does tie in with history. Very early within Jesus' followers, there seems, as far as we can reconstruct, to have developed two approaches. One approach, for example, James the Just personified this, wanted to keep Christianity essentially a form of Judaism, practicing all Jewish rituals. The other approach was to see Christianity as a worldwide movement and to take it outside of Palestine and outside of the Jewish community. And this, of course, is best known from the writings of Paul. We have in this James-Paul confrontation the very epitome of what Qumran is talking about. The letter of James, he speaks of, you know, if you break one small point of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. Therefore, be a keeper, not a breaker, be a doer. All words we get in the Qumran vocabulary. James is totally representative of the Qumran school of thinking. Commitment to the laws of the country, to the independence of the country, resistance to foreign rule resistance to foreign sacrifice in the in the temple resistance to anything foreign uh, paul is the very opposite and paul's way paul the very opposite 
Paul's way leads to the Gentile mission, speaking in tongues. Uh, Paul says that we are all equal in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul represents Hellenistic cosmopolitanism. Paul has come several years after the death of Jesus from distant Tarsus, from the world of Greeks and Romans. He is from good family and maybe even distantly related to Herodians, devils incarnate who are pious Jews. He doesn't resent the Romans. On the contrary, he is even a citizen of Rome and protected by its power. Those groups that were uh, arguing against Paul used the same language uh, to refer to him, calling him either an enemy, an adversary, a liar, a tongue, a man who could not control his tongue, using even the similar imagery that you have at Qumran, spouter of lying. The quarrel with the followers of James reverberates in the scriptures, and when he preaches opening the faith to Gentiles in the temple, Paul is beset by a crowd of angry Jews who try to kill him. Roman soldiers are at hand to carry him to safety. Out of Paul's pen comes another messiah, respectful of the powers that be, who turns the other cheek and renders unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Paul literally knows nothing about Jesus whatsoever. There's one fact he seems to know that he was crucified and came to a bad end. Other than that, he has no intimate materials. That's very surprising. Someone who lives in such proximity and would have known stories and heard stories from other people knows so little about this person. The figure Paul does know is this mystery figure who is revealing things to him from a heavenly position, the figure he calls Christ Jesus in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit mechanism that gives Paul the revelations about this Christ Jesus in heaven. But that's why Qumran groups would have referred to such a person as a man of lies or a dreamer or whatever, because obviously in a situation like that, the Christ Jesus in heaven becomes whatever you think he, he should be. That doesn't mean that that has anything to do with the earthly Jesus. Now, who would have known the earthly Jesus? Ah, oh, well, people like James, the person who lived with him, succeeded him, was martyred in the way he seems to have been martyred. So I say, once you found the historical James, you in effect have found the historical Jesus. Dispelled abroad repeatedly, Paul spreads his word to the outside world, away from the church of James. It is a mission better suited to the world of Gentiles, Greeks, Romans. The message of a Christ for everyone, a Jesus milder than the Messiah in the mold of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The vocabulary is the same. The concepts are inverted into their mere opposite. Instead of aggressiveness, we get pacifism. Instead of militancy, we get accommodation. Instead of this worldly apocalyptic messianism, we get otherworldly spiritualized messi me messianism. Instead of a messiah leading uh, the heavenly host in a final apocalyptic war against all, all evil on the earth, we get a, a messiah doing miracles and s a spiritualized uh, supernatural um, figure. The answer is very simple. The answer is because Roman power dictated a non-threatening, non militant, non-aggressive messianic movement that it would tolerate. The scrolls were refused to give this interpretation. The people of the scrolls refused to be part of this accommodation. In fact, the people of the scrolls were the very opposite, and they paid the final price. I believe one of the reasons the scrolls are in the caves is because no one could come back and get them. That means all of them perished. The year is 67, a full generation after Jesus dies. The Jews stand up against the power of Rome, spurred on by a star prophecy, which foretells the coming of a new world ruler to chase all evil from the earth. But no Messiah rises. The apocalypse turns into catastrophe and holocaust. Vespasian, later emperor of Rome, raises and plunders Palestine. The Jews, smoked out from desperate last stands, are decimated. Tens of thousands are crucified. People without number killed by the sword or carried into slavery. Jerusalem burns. The temple is razed to the ground, its treasures looted. In this holocaust, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls vanish and the Church of James evaporates. What's left are the communities Paul has established. They shape what will become Christianity and the Gospels.
no eyewitness accounts written by apostles, but separated from the real life of Jesus by one or more generations and the rift of Holocaust. Mark and Luke were written from 70 till 90 after the rising, Matthew from 80 till 100, and John even later, three or four generations after Jesus. How accurate are their Gospels? A crucial event for Christianity is the resurrection. How is its discovery described? In Mark, three women see a young man dressed in white. In Luke, three women and three men see two men in brilliant clothes. In Matthew, two women see one angel. In John, only Mary Magdalena sees two angels. In compiling its New Testament, the Church of Paul had many conflicting testimonials to choose from, and much was decided by contemporary politics. The selection would need to have a wide appeal and exclude what made it unpalatable for Gentiles. It would need to affirm a break with Judaism and deflect attention from the original church in Jerusalem. And ideally, it would transfer any blame attached to Rome in the death of Jesus to the Jews. Thus, Jesus becomes almost a non-Jew. The only form of messianism Rome was willing to live with was the form we now call Christianity. That later was, in fact, adopted into the Roman Empire in the way that we know it after 300 years. The only form of Judaism Rome was willing to live with is the form of Judaism we now know. And these are the implications for Judaism. That is rabbinic Judaism. Pharisee Judaism coming into rabbinic Judaism. Now the implications for Judaism are as extreme as the implications for Christianity because both have the same pharisaic view towards Roman power that I have been emphasizing. That is one of accommodation. And the star prophecy is used by its founder, an obscure rabbi that most of the world hasn't really heard of, Rabbi, rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Jews know him, but others don't know of him very, very well. He is described in the Talmudic materials as having himself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin at the time of the war against Rome, 66 to 70 AD. And he has an arrow shot into the Roman camp saying, Rabbi Yochanan is a friend of the emperor. Now that's an incredible thing. It shows the orientation of the Pharisee party. They were accommodating to Rome. He's then brought into the Roman camp, and he applies the messianic prophecy to Vespasian. Vespasian is the future Roman emperor to be the destroyer of Jerusalem, the father of the new imperial family called the Flavians. And the he leader, says... The general of the Romans. Right, and he says, you are the world ruler called from Palestine to rule the world. What this person has done is applied the most precious prophecy of his people to the destroyer of his people, the destroyer of the temple, and the destroyer of, the, of his homeland. Nothing could be more cynical. Nothing could be more humiliating. Now, what do we have in the scrolls? In the scrolls, we have the literature of the people who would not compromise. Now, we may believe that Rabbi Yochanan, or Jesus' policy, turning the other cheek, or as Paul say, says, the Roman authorities are the authorities that you must accept, we may, uh, uh, we may believe that that's pr pragmatic and the wisest policy to follow, but you cannot help but admire these people. Whether we agree with them or not, these people were willing to go the whole way. These were the martyrs of the period. The others were the accommodators. And the reason they didn't survive is because they were willing to go the whole way, and the literature we have that has come back to haunt us all is the scrolls. Nikea 324, three centuries after Jesus. Constantine, first Roman emperor to have embraced Christianity, has summoned the bishops. The empire is rent by bitter theological dispute about the true nature of Jesus, man or God. What Constantine imposes will become the basis for the Christian creed up until today. This is the creed to which we have unanimously declared ourselves signatories. In true Roman tradition, by a majority vote of the bishops and on imperial decree, Jesus becomes a God. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made... The course set by Paul is concluded. All other voices are silenced. 
the Dead Sea Scrolls speak of sons of God in a plural way. They are the perfect, and they are the people who are perfectly carrying out the law. How would the historic Jesus have felt if he would have known that he would be termed the divine son of God and only one? I think he would have been horrified, completely horrified. It's the very opposite of everything that he would or could have represented in the Palestine that we're talking about. Eisenman's views are fiercely contested. Maybe his ideas say more about the Bible than about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they rekindle facts historians have been considering for hundreds of years. Did the church get its facts about Jesus right? How much of the mystery of Christ is based on historic reality is open to question. How much that matters remains a question of faith. <laughs>